Welcome everyone to uh, the Launch of Women's Space Australia and our webinar. We've had around 500 people from all around the world register for this event, which is just wonderful. Um, and we're so forever grateful that um, people are really interested in wanting to know more about their own development and development careers of others around them. Um, to begin today, I would like to acknowledge the Bunurong people of Kulin Nation, uh, who are the traditional owners of the land and the waterways where I'm joining you from today in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and I'd like to recognise and acknowledge pay my respects to Elders past and present. Um, today, we are joined by such a fantastic uh, lineup of um, panel members, and I'd like to introduce them all to you quickly so we can get underway. Uh, firstly, Professor Elena Chipas, who's the Academic Director of Research Training School of Business Law and Entrepreneurship at Swinburne University of Technology. And Eleanor is also the co-chair of Waddle Steering Committee here in Australia. Welcome, Eleanor. Professor Letizia Gromalia, Academic Director of Learning and Teaching at Monash University. Welcome. Professor Sarah O'Shea, Dean of Graduate Research, Charles Sturt University. Dr. Nadine Zacharias, Managing Director and Founder of Equity by Design. Donna Trebleco, Performance and Leadership Coach at Chorus, Catherine Adcroft, uh, Development Manager, Aiken Centre for Medical Discovery at the University of Melbourne, and Andrea Strachan, Director of Student Services, University of Queensland, and Inbar Neve, Head of Learning and Develop Organisational Development, I should say, Origin Youth Mental Health. What a lineup. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Today, we uh, are so grateful to have two partners who've helped us uh, put this event together. And it is to celebrate the launch of Women's Space Australia, but everything that women do together and other people um, to help women flourish in their careers. And I would like to thank Waddle. Uh, they've been a great friend and partner for many years in different ways with the sector, but also uh, with Women's Space and jobs.ac.uk, um, who have been a terrific partner promoting uh, the work of women's space more globally outside of Australia. We have two themes today, reflection and planning and taking action, as you saw when you registered. Um, I'm going to work you through those. We won't cover it all. It's a lot to cover. Um, so we've received a lot of questions, which is fantastic when people registered. And what we do commit to doing is uh, responding to lots of those questions through blogs, newsletters, and, and further events. So we will get to them. You will hear if you've registered questions, some of them weaved into the webinar today. So I'd like to welcome Elena Cheapers, who is going to give her opening remarks and reflections on women in higher education. Um, and I'm just so proud to be joining her today. She works tire tirelessly to support women um, and their development okay. in their careers. Over to you. Thanks, Elena. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I, um, as as Naomi has said, we've been working since 2018. There's about five founding members um, that's been working on Wattle, and our focus is to create a pipeline of women that can take on leadership, as well as creating a network between these women. And we started in in 2018. We now, uh, uh, as of last week, we have 220 women that has gone through Wattle. It's a week long program. Uh, it focuses on women at live uh, academic women at level D and E, and also at uh, for professional you, uh, women that's at that U um, eight, nine, and ten um, level. Um, they come together for a week and they um, you know talk all things leadership uh, and 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 do an introspective kind of like thinking about where they would like to go. And why we we doing this is I, I would like to to give you some uh, of the statistics uh, around women specifically in Australia. And I know there's women, uh, uh, you know, uh, people that have signed in from all over the world. Uh, world. So I'll give you some statistics just about Australia. And some of this is is true for other uh, countries as well. Uh, in Australia, we have got about fifty eight percent women in the Australian university sector. 63% um, of level A and Bs are women. But when we get to level D and E, it drops down to 19%. Um, and if we look at um, just a gender divide, 61.4% of women are teaching only roles and 64% of all professional roles are um, held by women. 
When we go up um, the ranks, if we look at deputy vice chancellors, 37.5% are women, and vice chancellors, we're talking 24.3% are um, women. So we've got a long way before we can um, get parity, Um, and we're very proud of what we have been able to do for Wattle. Um, At the beginning of the year, we did a little bit of a survey on where women are, Um, and uh, about 69% of women that attended Wattle has moved up uh, into different roles, um, specifically academic women, and about 50% of professional women has moved into a different role. So we are excited. Uh, We would like to expand. So if your university is not um, uh, part of Wattle, you know, just uh, get in contact with us. We would love to hear uh, of you um, and to get you part of Wattle. So I'm looking forward to the rest of uh, this today, but that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. So we're going to get started with our um, first theme, uh, reflection and planning. Um, So when we're thinking about planning a change, why, what, when and how, I'm going to throw a couple of questions to the panel. So uh, Inba, uh, what is your top tip for planning your next career move? Well, I'm, I'm very much um, sticking to the theme. Um, hello, everyone. Really glad to be with you um, and amongst um, these esteemed people. Um, so uh, the first thing really is is about understanding your purpose for the career move. Um, I think that the most, and it's important to spend a lot of time on that, I think. I think um, from my own experience, I've certainly um, jumped at things because I was flattered to be offered something. Um, I've jumped at things because they offered something that looked kind of a bit shinier and better, but I didn't do my due diligence. So I think spending a lot of time reflecting on your purpose, so really understanding why, why this move um, and why now and defining um, those kind of key values. What are your negotiables? What are your non-negotiables? And really being very confident that you have those right. And they don't have to be um, for the next five or 10 years. They can be something that is just your next move might be looking ahead for the next one to two years. And um, I'm really big on uh, thinking about all of that in the context of your whole life, not just your work life. Um, I think particularly for us um, uh, in caring responsibilities, um, and of course that that tend to be mostly um, that does tend to mostly fall on women. Um, thinking about about what else is happening in our world and how much space and capacity we have. Again, from my own experience, I know that I um, after I had my first child, I was very quick to kind of put my hand up for really big roles. And um, I didn't do as well as I could have because the timing wasn't right for me. And then that really took a lot of confidence away from me. So really thinking about, is this the right time to do this? Um, uh, And, you know, if it's not now, then it will happen later as well. Um, Also within the context, um, thinking about that, um, and I saw that people um, put this in the questions as well, is thinking about, you know, you and your health and where you're at in your stage of life. Um, I know someone mentioned um, perimenopause and menopause. I know for me that's been a really big factor in terms of how I look at things um, in 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 this period of my life. Um, so, yeah, coming back to that, why, what's the purpose of this and what's the context of this and really spending time on that is the first step. Thanks, Emma. That's terrific advice. And, Sarah, how much experience is required in higher levels of leadership before the door of opportunity opens? uh, Or do we need to be proactive and go for positions that we might not have the depth of experience in? Oh, thanks, Naomi. Uh, Such a good question. Look, I think uh, most women tend to underestimate their ability. And so there's sort of a reluctance to go for leadership roles until they're almost overqualified. And I think that's reflected in the stats that Eleanor pointed to in her opening address. So I think when I've reflected on this question and reflected on my own career, um, for me, uh, what's been the most influence on my career and whether I go for a leadership role is not my own perception of my skills, um, but rather it's um, it's been other people and often women who have encouraged me to apply for a role or put myself forward for an opportunity. Because having someone else believe in you 
and suggest you're ready for that promotion um, or that career move can be so fundamentally inspiring. Um, and I think that's why it's so important as women that we need to be conscious that as we progress through our careers, we need to put a hand back and help the next woman up, which is why I was so thrilled to be involved in this. And, and a helping hand doesn't have to be particularly onerous. You know, it could just be words of encouragement. It could be informal mentoring, uh, maybe by providing a reference for someone, a short tweet of support, a repost on LinkedIn or Twitter, X, whatever you're on. Um, I often think about uh, Julia Gillard and Ngozi Okujo Awila's book. Uh, I hope I pronounced her name correctly. Um, they did a fabulous work called Women in Leadership. But one quote has stayed with me. And they, um, they say in that book, you know, there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women, you know. So I think it's, um, it's, it's about each of us helping each other and encouraging each other and scaffolding that next jump to a leadership role. Terrific. I agree. And and I agree. Sometimes it can be simply a tap on a shoulder to just to prompt you uh, um, to think about it. Yeah, we could be very powerful. Um, that book, we just produced a summer reading list for leadership, women in leadership on our blog. Um, and so we've got that book listed and also um, some great top tips too, as particularly around sponsorship. So talking about brand, it doesn't have to be brand, it could be, you know, goals and values. Donna, what are the ways that uh, you can reflect on um, your own brand, uh, or the advice you can give others, and what's your top tip for ensuring your brand can drive your career? Yeah, thanks, Naomi. Um, I was thinking about this kind of idea of a magic formula for personal branding, and I don't know if there is one, but for me, I think branding really equals intention plus authenticity. So I think there's something in knowing and being able to articulate the things that are most important to you, such as your values, your strengths, so what you're good at, uh, what you're passionate about, and the things that might set you apart from others in your field. And consider whether you're showing up in a consistent way. So how you're seen by your peers and leaders uh, what they can count on you for. And when I'm thinking about this one, I love um, using this phrase, I'm the kind of person who, and, you know, fill in the blanks. And just ensure that that's reflected in the way that you present yourself across different platforms. So that includes LinkedIn, any personal websites, social media, and also includes any industry relevant platforms as well. And to really, I think, amplify that impact of that intention is to show up in a way that's authentic to you. So, for example, I know someone who wears bright red lipstick as part of her personal brand, and she does that in her profile pictures and in her online video content when she's presenting at workshops, and it really works for her. But if you're someone who hates wearing lipstick and red isn't your colour, then that inauthenticity is going to show and you'll struggle to build the trust of those who you work with or you aspire to work with. So I think um, to summarise, your brand isn't just about how you look and what you wear. It's also about how you consistently show up in the world, what people can count on you for, um, the value you bring, how you present yourself in a way that reflects those things. Brilliant, I agree. And Letizia, is it normal for women to undersell themselves by not believing that they have the experience or is not a good a candidate as others? Thank you, Naomi. Um, yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, um, there is there is literature and, and research that shows that there is a significant uh, gender gap in self-promotion. Um, but what I find really interesting in that research is that it shows that it's not just about confidence. It not, it's not simply about confidence. Um, women tend to under, tend to undersell themselves um, also when um, we know that we actually do have the experience to go for that particular job or that particular promotion. Um, and what that means is that um, those that what comes across as confidence is really just behaviors that we have um, learned to to internalize in response to certain social norms that are reflected then in the workplace. For example, we are not very good at claiming individual achievements. Women tend to talk about collective group achievements. We're very bad at using the word I when we talk about, you know, what, what we've achieved as in, in our careers. Um, 
and that's also because we know we've learned by experience in in our daily lives that you know we're judged differently when we do that we're judged negatively when we do that when we self promote um and in my experience i um i see for example lots of promotion cases both from male and female colleagues and what i try to do with um with my female um colleagues with women is the the translation of their experience into something that uses that that leadership language that men find more easy to adopt and to use and to showcase um so like like sara was saying earlier finding critical friends finding a mentor that can help you to do that translation process ask others how they see you how they see your leadership skills and then use that thank you and thinking about imposter syndrome which i know has talked about so much and just at water last week here in melbourne um, it was a, a really hot topic Catherine, how do you overcome imposter syndrome and spread your wings thanks naomi so personally i don't think i've overcome it but rather perhaps learn to live with it and try to limit the impact um so uh, when I got the email from Elena and Naomi about this event and I looked up the rest of the panel, my immediate thought was, oh, they've made a mistake. They shouldn't have invited me. Why have they sent this to me? Um, and then I imagined what Elena would say back to me if I uh, wrote to her and said, I think you've made a mistake. And I also imagined what my best friend would have said to me, which is something along the lines of, you bloody idiot. Um, so I guess my strategies for living with that and limiting the impact are understanding that they're going to be intrusive thoughts like that. I'm not trying to analyse them too much, but rather being able to set them aside um, separately in my mind so that they're not influencing my decisions. And um, I guess building on what Letty's just said is having an amazing network of um, women through something like Wattle, um, professional mentors, sponsors. And also in the last couple of years, I've made sure that I talk with my friends around my career as well. And I can hear their voices giving me strength and um, perspective, which really helped to minimise that intrusive thoughts as well. Fantastic. And you mentioned networks. So thinking about the importance importance of networks, Andrea, how important are they, networks, in managing your career? And what are your top tips for career networking? Gosh, look, I am, oh, there's my light off. Uh, the, look, net, networking, of course, is, is really crucial in helping manage your career. And colleagues have touched on on how important some of that support and colleagues support networks are. It's not always an obvious pursuit and some, some colleagues, and we all know people who are great at it, they're very deliberate and purposeful in their connections. But I think as your network grows just through time, through, through your network growing with you, and sometimes you need to, you can take time to reflect on those connections and experiences so that you're actually using that purposeful approach, but almost retrospectively applying it so you understand understand the strength of your network that should then really give you a bit of confidence so that you do have the connections and, and networks that are indeed part of that support system that others have touched on already and and they can offer you further assistance in, in identifying those insights into to topics job opportunities absolutely professional development and and then that personal branding piece as well so the reflection of that and i think following on from donna's comments around authenticity authenticity is is such a kind of key piece in networking as well i think when we're building professional relationships we need to be genuine in our in our interactions people appreciate the authenticity, don't they? And, and it helps establish that solid foundation for these long-term connections. And that's important because it goes hand in hand with reciprocity. You, you don't network or you cannot network solely with the intention of getting something, but by building those meaningful and, and mutually beneficial relationships, you build the network slowly on the basis of evidence and, and value and in so doing, then understanding the value of each connection more deeply. So I think those authentic connections, and, and this is the key piece for me, is the authentic connections are more likely to be reciprocal and beneficial in the in the long run. And of course, as our career paths 
will invariably involve twists and turns and and this professional network can and that we've touched on but can provide that emotional support as well in time and encouragement and the advice during what can be challenging times when you're looking at your own career growth I agree and some great advice I was told was just ask just ask for advice ask for help ask for feedback just ask um, because you as women and as leaders you are very generous in in giving um, but not always brave enough just to ask and um, someone will always help uh, in some way. Um, so, Sarah, again, how can we support women? Um, this is a question from one of our participants. From the oppression of religion, capitalism and other sorts of ideological dominance uh, with our networks or with sponsorship, what are your thoughts? Yeah, look, this is uh, another great question. And um, I think, you know, different speakers on the panel have touched on this. I mean, networks are obviously very key, the necessity of women helping other people. But if I can take a bit of a broader uh, uh, look at this as well and look at it with a broader lens, um, I think the first thing is, because uh, I work from a sociological perspective, is actually to recognize that uh, this oppression is occurring, really, and that it's often embedded into accepted ways of being and doing. Um, so it, it, in a way, if we can cast a critical eye on that and recognize that it is constructed, then that that helps because then you can begin to question um, things that are often taken for granted. Um, and, and that's something I've done a lot in my research from a student perspective and looking at how um, different social structures impact on diverse students. Um, you know, because a male perspective in many ways is embedded across so many different aspects of life. I was lucky enough to be invited to the Wattle presentation um, a few weeks ago. And uh, in my research for that, I, I, I discovered that um, even car design is dictated by a male perspective, which means that 47% um, of women are, we're, sorry, as women, we're 40 seven percent more likely to die in a car crash because cars are designed with male bodies in mind um and so you know i find that that plays out in academia so i'm sort of looking at, at academia in particular in terms of the emphasis on the individual um and this focus on being a fast professor or uh, this mantra of publish or perish or funding and famine. They're very, um, I think, very male constructs. And there are alternative ways of being an academic. And I, I, I love the work of Agnes uh, Bosenkesh, who publishes on the slow academic and talks about a different, actually more feminine way, I think, of being an, an academic, um, even though, you know, there might be some host hostility to that. So that's one point I wanted to make is recognizing that that this is very constructed and that we need to challenge uh, those structures. And I suppose my second point is really around this going back to networking, because really that's why events like this and Wattle are so important, because they actually create a safe space um, for women to articulate articulate these sort of, I, I call them microaggressions that we often encounter uh, within our professional lives. Um, and, you know, I, I think some universities have recognized this and are moving to a more grassroots type of uh, approach to addressing it. I'm thinking of Charles Sturt here, uh, where we, we've just implemented a whole range of diversity champions, which are being led by key staff leaders. And I think that's a, a really excellent way of, of building up uh, capacity and addressing oppression, but doing it sort of from the, the, the ground up rather than top down. Great answer, Sarah, um, such experience to share with us. Um, so, well, it's interesting, your fun facts about our design. I mean, so many things um, in the world are invented in that way. But um, And slow is something I know Christina Hughes was talking to me about the other week around slow leadership, and it's just about uh, not the rush, and she's going to do some work on that. But it's um, particularly after the times that we've been in and the, the times that we're going into, I think it's important. So the must do always, if we talk about um, taking action, and thanks to everyone who's starting to send some questions through, we'll get to those. Um, and for to Heather for her comments. Um, 
must do always. Donna, what are your three top tips for what women must always be doing to manage and develop their careers, not just when they think about it, but always? Yeah, so I'll try to keep this tight. So I think my first tip is that I believe that the inner work that we do really does drive the outer work. So how you're developing yourself as a human being, first and foremost, it will impact how effectively you show up as a team member, as a leader, and how effectively you can apply your technical knowledge to be in service of uh, the people and the outcomes that you're responsible for. So for me personally, working both with coaches and mentors along the way has really made an incredible difference to the way I've been able to develop my own career. Um, I think like we've all got blind spots. So working with someone you trust who is impartial and can perhaps help you see where your strengths are, where you might have some opportunities for development and how they might support you to lean into those opportunities is really invaluable for keeping your self-development relevant and also focused. Um, My second tip is kind of building on the theme of self-development or that inner work. So I'd offer that perhaps continuous learning and skill development are also incredibly important in today's um, really rapidly evolving job market. So we are living in a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world. So it is critical that we seek out and I think, in fact, create new ways to nurture and apply an ever-evolving skill set to bring value to the world. So look for new ways that you can apply your strengths and actively seek out opportunities to be involved in projects or roles that will stretch you and um, build new skills. So be courageous there. Um, And that brings me to my third tip, which is really something that Andrea spoke about and which I'd really like to enforce, uh, reinforce rather, is that um, building and nurturing your network is just so important because widening that network can just open so many doors for you. So throughout my career, I've learned that the key to networking isn't about awkward small talk and swapping business cards. It's really about building those meaningful connections. And the way that you can do that first and foremost, again, is by being genuine and sincere. So if you're open enough to say to someone, hey, I need help with a thing, and Naomi actually mentioned that before, most people are going to want to offer a suggestion or know someone they can connect you with because people are generally pretty wonderful and helpful by nature. So be really clear on your elevator pitch, who you are, what you do, what you need, and what you can also bring to the table. Um, Because it was also mentioned, you know, networking does go both ways. So be curious, what advice can you offer? What resources can you be generous with? Who can you introduce someone to that might help them? And I guess finally, just show your gratitude, you know, a simple uh, but heartfelt thank you can go a really long way in helping you build those positive relationships. Thanks, Donna. And Inba, uh, what are some professional ways to learn about a team's dynamic and maybe managers, management styles or leaders before going through an interview process or even further into signing a contract and taking on a new role? That's a very good question. We we can't really, I think it's very hard to really, really know, but there are some things that we can do. And I love the way that the question is framed with professional ways we can we can do that. Um, so there, there's a couple of things that I'm that I really believe in. Um, one is, of course, asking a lot of questions at any stage. And I'm a really big believer in, you know, when the if there's something that's grabbed you and you feel like is is the right fit, connects to your purpose, your values, everything that we've already touched on, um, then ring ahead. Um, if there's any contact details there, make sure that you make the connection early, ask the questions so you can ha- hopefully save yourself the time um, later. It also means that if it is something you want to pursue, um, you've already made a connection, and you've already made an impression, and hopefully it's a really good one. Um, and you've shown a lot of interest, and that's going to get people excited as well. So I think that's that's a really good place to start. Um, but then there's uh, throughout the process, there's lots of opportunities to ask a lot of questions. Or um, I wrote down for myself here, interrogate. So you know the recruiter um, or the hiring manager, and and also the interview panel. So making sure that you've got lots of questions ready. Um, some ex- some examples of questions that I like to ask are, um, obviously, I really like to know about the context of the role becoming available um, so you can get a little bit of perspective of what's happened and, and how how's the role um, come to be. Um, I also like to ask people, especially a hiring manager, um, if I was successful in the role, you know, uh, what would my first three months look like? And that that's a nice big open question. 
um, that allows them to articulate the kind of focus areas. Um, I know that I went to an interview once and um, and it was like, well, you got to deliver from day one. And, you know, that was, <laughs> um, that was kind of gave me a really good sense of the hiring manager. And, and it was, um, yeah, that was a, a, in the type of role that it was, I felt like that was totally unrealistic and didn't allow for um, this person to come in and to really um, ground themselves and learn about the organisation and, and it, so they can make informed decisions and, and contribute in meaningful ways. Um, also, I like to ask about, you know, questions like, you know, if I were to speak to your most um, uh, significant stakeholders, um, you know, how would they describe, uh, you know, this function or this team? Um, what would they say uh, about this team? So it's kind of trying to get a feel for the reputation of the team. And thinking about the wording of these questions is quite important. I know in the past, I used to be really big on just kind of going straight out and going, what's the reputation of this team? Um, but being able to ask it in a kind of more roundabout, gentle way allows for them to be um, a little bit more relaxed about um, with their response. The other thing that um, I think is really, really important, and particularly, um, I do think this speaks to all of us, but potentially more to women, is to really carefully observe the recruitment process, um, all, all the interactions, the communications, and how you actually feel um, throughout that process. And sometimes you may not be able to put your finger on it, or label it, or name it, but if something doesn't feel right, I think it's really important to listen to that and explore that. Um, and I'm a big one about writing those notes down and kind of testing that because usually to me that signals a bit of a red flag. And if it seems like a red flag that you think you might be able to dismiss, um, I can assure you that it's probably not, um, that in my opinion. So again, it will come back to being able to come back to your purpose and values. And so you can really test those things and have a bit more data before you're making a big decision. Terrific. Um, Letty, just quickly, I just was going to ask you if you've if you've reached your goal, top leadership or full professor, um, what comes next and how do you how do you determine what those next goals should be? Thank you, Navi. Um, well, that's that's an interesting question. I would say that in higher education in particular, there, there there's never a career stage where you 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 know you achieve um static position. So it's always an evolving role and an evolving position where you constantly have to sort of prove your your relevance in a in a way. So just continuing to always be a better version of your of your professional self and, and someone earlier has mentioned sort of continuous development. But there are there are a few things that for me are particularly important in in identifying the next step. If you if you have a clear sense of what your your passions are and where you want to go and what areas you want to focus on, if you're on a on a um, trajectory that allows for promotion, immediately look at your um, your next stage. So if you've achieved full professor, sometimes that's a senior leadership management in in other parts of the university look at those job specs, be very strategic in identifying the gaps and what you say yes to and what you say no to, because I think we're we're very often not very good at saying no, but being a bit strategic about how we protect our time and where we focus our energies. Um, and the other thing that is really important for me is um, staying true to your to your core values, whatever decision you take, whatever direction you, you decide to go in, um, make sure that the role that might seem like the next natural step in terms of progression is something that whether because of the context or because of the nature of that role really speaks to your values you you know you can't change your values you shouldn't compromise on your values you can change some of your behaviors and adapt but your core values make sure that that you stay you know firmly um close to your values in in whatever position you go for couldn't agree more. And Nadine, I'm so pleased to have you here. You've taken a, a different step to some of the other panellists. You're, you're uh, running your own consultancy now. You're still in the sector, but in, uh, in many different capacities and many different hats, I suppose. So we we'll talked a little bit about backup plans. But what do you think backup plan uh, looks like for women in their careers, senior leaders, contractors or consultants? What does it look like? And what are your top tips for making the bold move to a consultancy or establishing your own business? 
Yes. And look, I think it's a con continuation of the previous themes of the must-haves. I think a backup plan is a total must-have at any point of your career because it gives you agency and it gives you a sense of being in control of your own destiny and your own um, workplace situation. I mean, some women, you know, go through their lives and I talked to very senior women not that long ago who had never had a bad boss and had never found herself in a situation where she felt a bit trapped. Um, but most of us are not that uh, lucky in, in our careers. And so when you are in a situation where you go, how do I get myself out of here? If you don't have a backup plan, you know, like that feeling of being stuck and becoming bitter and twisted and not your best self at work, um, you know, like that creeps in really fast. So I think a backup plan in that sense is an absolute lifeline. Um, and so for me, you know, like uh, being being self-employed, running my own business um, was plan B, was my backup plan for a long time before it turned into plan A. Um, so I am from a, a, a small business family. My mum ran her own business for a long time. So I had a really good role model and I sort of that always bubbled under the surface for me. And I actually set up the company four years before I, you know, turned it into a full time endeavor. And I guess um, my top tips for, you know, if you're contemplating the move, um, there's, there's six of them. Um, and um, the first one really goes to where Inba started us, and that is your purpose. You know, what are you really trying to achieve with this move? You know, why are you contemplating the move into self-employment? And I think you need to be really clear what you want to achieve. And in most cases, there'll be push and pull factors. You know, like there'll be things you, you want to move away from, you know, like in your current career. And then there's things you absolutely want to move towards. And I think if you don't have both, particularly if you don't have a pull, if you're not having something that you're moving towards, you know, be really careful with, you know, like thinking the grass is greener on the other side because it might not be. So you need a really, really strong pull factor for you, why you want to take that step. I think the second one, and I'm um, really privileged to be in a really cool um, MBA program at the moment, which is called the Inner MBA, which really thinks about how do you bring spirituality and mindfulness to business? Um, and so they are really strong about product. You know, what's your product? What is, and Donna has spoken to this, what's your brand? You know, what's your unique value proposition? So what are you putting out into the marketplace um, that people might find value in? Um, and that was that was a, a big part of you know my journey as to what can I what can I offer that is uniquely my contribution in this space. The third one is risk, and three and four go together, right? Um, it's risk and fear, and how do you assess your risk, um, both both financial and psychological, and then how do you deal with fear? And they become a really important sort of step in the process. So for me, um, again. Um, my situation is that this thing had to make money from day one, you know, like, so it, it truly had to perform from pretty early on. Um, and so cash flow analysis is the real thing. And don't be overly uh, optimistic in your cash flow analysis, right? So th this, that was one of my big um, considerations, you know, so I had to keep paying the mortgage and, you know, keep a roof over our heads. Um, and the other thing was something my coach said to me, um, which became a real game changer, you know, in stepping off what was quite a a promising career you know it was a career that went somewhere um, and could have been progressed and then to choose you know uncertainty um, you know perceived uncertainty um, as the opposing idea she said you just have to pull up the floor right you can't stand on the edge and look into the abyss right you have to pull this up into something that seems like a manageable step and that brings me to fear so I think in that moment when you're making the decision you just have to hold your nerve long enough to actually ask for that meeting with your boss and say, I'm going, right? This is it. I'm out of here. Um, and, and fear will meet you. You know, like it'll be the first one, the, your first companion when you are contemplating a big move is, is fear. So one of the key ways, you know, like to manage this transition is to manage your fear. Um, part of this is also how to manage your loved ones, you know, like so really get them on side and make them understand why you're doing it yeah, what you want to do and why you're doing it. Um, and some pointed conversations, particularly with parents, were had. Um, and then my final tip is hire an excellent accountant because that's the, that's the part that you don't want to be dealing with, right? And, and if you're really lucky, poach your old assistant, you know, to, to do your invoicing and your, and your bookkeeping. Um, they, are, they are my hot tips about, you know, how to, to contemplate and then make work the transition into self-employment. And it is super rewarding, right? If I can just say that. So it, you know, it, it can be a super rewarding step and really open up 
um, possibilities that you don't have, you know, in a in a job. Thank you, and thank you for for sharing. Um, that is just wonderful advice. And uh, fear is the first person that greets you. It's pretty uh, pretty good advice, you know. Um, so, Andrew, if you think about fear, yeah. resilience, and uh, you know, we talk about inner mentors and um, uh, other guidance that we have within ourselves and and from our networks. How do you stay resilient when you're making a career change? Gosh, like making a career change and focusing on any sort of development, wherever that might be, can be challenging. And I don't know whether, Naomi, resilience is what we need to focus on, but certainly staying positive and, and focused during this period of changes is, is really important in navigating those challenges. And in some ways, you need to be as clear as possible about your goal. And really importantly, be kind to yourself in the navigation of it. And some of the strategies, I guess, that you might seem or seem really basic that you could use but but they they're really basic like setting expectations things take time you've got to be realistic and I don't mean don't stretch we've heard from Sarah earlier about I wouldn't want us to set realistic expectations and put put barriers in place but we do need to be realistic and understand that knockbacks and setbacks are as much part of the the learning journey as our successes we talked earlier about using your support systems and those networks and that again that comes into play here too and I think we we might also add in in terms of your networks add in your family and your mentors so use that support system there be as positive and stay positive because this will also add to and aid your adaptability really so some elements in your your whole situation your family life maybe, maybe your location that type of thing they might be non-negotiable but flexibility and openness to to change your plans and it will help in in the search and an ability to take on new opportunities importantly of course we do have to take care of ourselves and our own self and in doing so recognize these small wins giving ourselves that kindness that recognition and, and space to reflect and that's how we know that we'll learn from any of the setbacks and the wins enjoy it enjoy this process of growth and change and find joy in learning experiences which is is what we would say to to anyone else and we've got to be kind to ourselves and do that too i think we need to remember that resilience isn't about avoiding difficulties, but about adapting and bouncing back from them. And each challenge, of course, is, is that opportunity for growth and development. And with the resilience, you can, when, with resilience in that way, then you can navigate that those changes and challenges successfully, I think. Brilliant, excellent, thank you. And so Catherine, if you've had um, maybe a negative experience or you're in, in one, um, and you're looking to to make a change either within the organisation up in or out. Um, what are some good techniques to help manage during that those times and, and move into the future? Yeah, so look, I'm I love my job and I'm very passionate about my career. So I know that in the moment setbacks can, you know, they're very hard to see through. But I think as I get older, um, time does heal your wounds and things do tend to work out. But I also really think that setbacks can be your time to shine. Um, so I think um, er, exactly the same way that you have a friends that are, you know, they're there in the good times, but when you see how they behave in the bad times, um, that's where you really see their value. So um, I wanted to talk today about a personal experience that I've had um, with this. So I was acting in a role at a previous organisation and um, when it came to interview for that role, um, I was overlooked for that role and then was in a position where I needed to um prepare the whole team for a change in leadership and direction and onboard my new manager. And look, privately, I was absolutely mortified and I had so many day-to-day -day experiences where I just felt really embarrassed. I had a lot of people wanting to gossip with me and say negative things. Um, but I decided that I really needed to be professional and kind of demonstrate my professional skills there. And so with what I hope was 
grace and a lot of respect for my new manager and the boundaries of um, her role in leadership. Um, I hope that I acted professionally through that and that was actually observed by other areas of the organisation because when you're at work, you're always being observed and that actually led to me getting a much better role because those people saw how I behaved in response to that situation and um you know it was really valued and then in retrospect I realized that I was perfect for the new role and the person who had been given that role that I was acting in was a much better fit but I just couldn't see that at the time because that was like kind of personally devastating so yeah and I guess my last point on this is that um, we all want perfect skin, but I think the little scars actually make you really smart and you kind of need bad things to happen to get your little scars because now I think um, I can see things coming a mile off and I'm so much smarter at navigating people and my career because you've had that little scar and so you know you know what the problem's going to look like and that's actually a fantastic lesson. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank, and thank you for sharing. And um, something I heard from you and, and Nadine, which I've experienced is when things are happening to you or you're taking some leaps, it's about sometimes me, you have to manage people around you on top of your own stuff. So, um, yeah, so thank you. I really appreciate you sharing that that journey. Um, we will get to some of the Q&A, um, but as I said at the start, I'd like to keep the webinar moving and uh, if I do miss some, then we will absolutely produce some responses in our blogs and newsletters over the coming weeks. We won't forget anybody. Um, uh, so, Sarah, an inner mentor, what is that to you? And is an inner mentor, or inner mentor helpful building your career? Yeah, thanks, Naomi. And also thank you, Catherine. That was a really lovely uh, story. And I'm sure one that we can all um, sort of, you know, agree with. Um, I, I'll keep this relatively brief, um, but I, I suppose an inner mentor for me is um, an older, uh, wiser version of me um, and equally someone that I'd like to be. So it's like a um, a, a, a twin, but much older and much better. Um, and part of sort of having that inner mentor, I think for me is my values. So I've spent a lot of time critically reflecting on my values, my why. Um, and so I use my values in the shape of my inner mentor, if you like, to actually guide um, the decisions that I make and the career decisions that I make, as well as the way that I engage with other people and with the sector more broadly. So I, 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 that's an inner mentor for me. Yeah, brilliant. And we've put on our, um, I think it's on our top 10 tips, the inner mentor visualisation that you can do for, um, as a courtesy of Tara Moore, um, so that resource is available. But Nadine, any thoughts on new careers in diversity and inclusion within the sector? Look, I think it's a terrific time to be in the sector if you're interested in DNI roles, in in student equity, in more inclusive practice. You know, like this is the time. Um, so we are waiting with abated breath for the court review report that will come down early next year. And I think there'll be plenty, you know, in there for for those of us who are interested in that kind of work. Um, and you know, if Bradley is anything to go by, you know, they'll it'll be spawning um a lot of new roles um at, at all levels of of universities. Um, to really, you know, like keep an eye on, um, put your hand up. And I think I would go as far as um, to say, you know, like um, equity and diversity as a skill set is going to become a core skill set as we are moving forward into a more universal tertiary education system. So again, you know, there are lots of roles in capability building, in coaching, in leadership development, you know, like that, that yeah, it'll be a whole range of opportunities that will open up uh, from early next year. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And and last one over to Letty. Where do you think the third space uh, in the sector can go in the next few years? Australia and or the UK, where you've um, arrived from or, or other parts of the world you've worked? 
Thank you, Naomi. Um, well, in a way, um, it sort of follows from what Nadine was saying and the, the sort of roles that she's mentioned. The idea of sort of third space professionals has been around for a while in, in the UK. I think it was introduced in probably 2008 by Celia Whitchurch. Um, and it's a role that sort of, it, it, it's, to it's used to describe those professional roles that sit in between the academic and the non-academic space. But um, I've, not, I've only been in Australia for a, for a short, very short period of time. But um, similar to, to Nadine's point, looking at the draft, uh, you know, the interim report, the accord the interim report, what I read in that is um, a strong emphasis on the value that those professions are going to have for universities in Australia, um, because that, um, that necessity for universities to show that they are investing in improving the quality of teaching, improving or, or the perceived uh, improvement of, 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 you know, improvement of what is perceived to be not, not, um, not uh, high quality, but um, and also sort of that focus on the student learning experience and doing that in a in an evidence informed way means that those roles are going to be really critical, really crucial in the same way in which they've become quite critical in in England in particular in the aftermath of of tech whatever we think about the, the teaching excellence framework as an exercise, but it's a very similar narrative that I see in the accord to, to what started in the UK a few years ago. Thanks, Lady. So we're going to try and grab some questions off the Q&A. Um, so I'm just going to ask our panel members, maybe put up their hand if they um, would like to answer. How does one navigate a system, navigate a system and attain a leadership role where the culture is one of belittling others and of promoting friends. Does anyone want to have a go at that? Oh, Donna, there we go. Thanks, Donna. Yeah, I'm sure uh, there'll be lots of people who have something to, to add to this, but from my perspective, I think it's really important to understand uh, in your mind, know exactly what it's going to look like, sound like, feel like when it's time to move on. Um, you, you can't kind of fit a square peg into a round hole. So for me... Um, you know, sometimes trying to make it work, trying to fit into what might be a toxic culture or a culture that just isn't a good values alignment for you. Um, it might be worthwhile just thinking about actually where where else can I go where I can really shine and really flourish and um, really do my best work. Thank you. And uh, another one here, higher ed produces rich research and insights all the time. Where do you think we go wrong when applying and using this knowledge in development of our own people, skills? And knowledge was a question. Um, my experience at Wattle is that it's okay to not be ambitious as well, and that's something that I think we um we sometimes forget to talk about. That um, air, and I think people have talked about that in terms of the right time of your life and things, feeling a lot of pressure to be ambitious and keep achieving when it you may actually really like where you are or it may not be the right time in your life. And I think in the higher ed system, because it's so hierarchical, we constantly have pressure to be thinking about the next thing. So it's something to be said around that slow. Um, it's okay to sit where you are for a while. Thanks, Catherine. And um, we heard that from um, someone at Waddle on Friday that um, sometimes you do need to pause um, and and that's okay as well. So um, thank you. And I'll just take one uh, last one, I think. Um, do you think it's actually possible to challenge or change the patriarchal, hierarchical Western structure of academia? Sarah. Yeah, look, I think it's a, it's obviously a slow process, but to me, you know, one of the key things around this is getting more diversity around the table in terms of leadership of higher ed institutions. Um, and, you know, it, it it's actually including more voices around the table, which is happening slowly, um, probably a little too slowly, but I've been in the game for a long time. And so I've seen shifts already, you know, I've seen 
slight changes. It's not dramatic change, but I'll give you an example. You know, the fact that uh, career interruptions now are quite a, a valued part of a promotion if you're an academic in universities, where years ago they weren't, they, they, they weren't even considered. So progress is slow, but it, it is happening. Terrific. And I'll, I'll take, oh, Nadine, sorry. Um, I'd also say, you know, like the conversations we are going to have about students and what does it really mean to support students in a more universal higher education system is going to shift a lot of the conversation because we will need to rethink how we teach, how we support, you know, like how we employ our staff, how we develop our staff, you know. So I really think if that sector change comes off at a structural level that will give rise to a lot of really interesting conversations around you know what we have to do both in terms of learning and support design and with how we you know like train develop and employ our people yeah i agree thank you i'm going to try and fit one last one in for people who are this is a topic at waddle perimenopausal menopausal or experiencing brain fog of whatever type that might be what advice would you give them with changing jobs and careers do I want to have a go at that? I, I will, because this is not me sometimes. Just give yourself a break, yeah? <laughs> um, be kind to yourself. Someone said that earlier. It's just a part of the world, and we heard at Waddle last week about um, the um, developments and innovation happening in so many workplaces um, around um, supporting half or almost of the, um, the workforce. Um, but in terms of changing jobs and careers, you really have to think forward. Um, and this happened to me recently. What, where do you really want to spend your time? What do you really want to do? And what absolutely makes you happy? Um, because uh, you you will run out of time, you know, um, and you don't want to waste your time. But Imbo, I'll throw to you and then we'll wrap up. Um, we talked a lot about, you know, building our village around us, a, a really strong network. I think part of that at this stage of life as well is is having a really good GP or um, someone, a specialist of whatever kind that speaks to you to support you through that process as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I want to thank everybody on the panel today and I really want to thank our participants um, who are either here or are going to watch us back shortly when we um, produce the video. I, I very much want to thank Eleanor and all the people at Waddle. Um, it's there is space for everybody, and we are all on the same page. We all want to um, help other women, and this is a very voluntary activity that we're doing to um, give back uh, to women in education. I thank the panelists for that. I thank Eleanor and all of her team, and I'd like to thank Jobs.ac.uk, who've just been tremendous um, in getting the message out that, hey, we're, something's happening in Australia. Um, and lastly, to thank this is Christina Hughes. It's her baby women's space, and she trusts me and others with it um, to keep doing, doing the work. So I absolutely want to uh, thank her and, again, congratulate her publicly um, on her recent um, honour that she received at the House of Lords. Um, everyone, when they leave the webinar, will hit a quick survey if you just put on a couple of questions and say whether you liked it, didn't like it, like it and what you'd like to hear about in the future. That helps us just develop some content and make sure it's hitting the mark for people. Um, and again, thank you. We really appreciate it and we hope you've enjoyed today's webinar. Thank you.